nodular fasciitis, uh, an oldie but a goodie, and it's one that you can never see or talk about enough because it can be scary sometimes. One thing to keep yourself out of trouble is size. Nodular fasciitis usually is less than three centimeters, okay? Could it be three and a half centimeters or four centimeters? Sure. Could it be 10 centimeters? No way. At least not in my opinion. There are some other things in the fasciitis family that can be really large, um, like um, ischemic fasciitis and uh, fasci uh, myositis ossificans. Those things can get pretty good size. Maybe not 10 centimeters from myositis ossificans, but anyway. That's a, a story for another lecture. But nausea fasciitis, it should be small. If it's bigger than three centimeters, really think twice about the diagnosis and make sure it's nothing else that it could be, all right? It's often arising off of fascia. You can see a strip of dense, regular pink connective tissue there. That's fascia, tendon, ligament. All of those things are dense, regular connective tissue. In this context, it's fascia. And the tumor can either push up into the subcutis like is happening in this case, or can push down from the fascia into the muscle or it can track along the fascia and be kind of linear and spiky and stellate looking. And that's the so-called fascial pattern of nausea fasciitis. Those can be a bit more tricky to recognize. But usually it's a nodule that's pushing either up or down from the fascia. And sometimes it can arise off of the fascia, like in the dermis. You know, I've seen that before uh, where there's no connection to the fascia. But uh, the other thing that we see beautifully demonstrated is here in the middle and also uh, a little more subtle down at the edges, these myxoid cystic spaces. Cystic degeneration is common in nausea fasciitis and is an incredibly useful diagnostic clue. It's not always big like this, but usually you'll find little areas where the tumor cells are starting to fall apart. And I said tumor because even though we used to think of this as a reactive myofibroblastic process because it looks so much like reactive myofibroblasts, in fact, it turns out these actually have a translocation and they are a form of neoplasia, we currently think. And there's a closer look at that myxoid cystic degeneration. Well developed here on the right, but more subtle and early over here. Any of those forms, if you see a myofibroblastic proliferation with myxoid pockets or pools or cystic change, that is a great clue for nodular fasciitis. And then here's the so-called tissue culture pattern, which I've never grown tissue culture or a fibroblast in a tissue culture dish. So that term doesn't really have uh, meaning to me outside of nodular fasciitis. So uh, I think to me, the, the terms I like to use to describe these areas are loose and feathery, um, but some people call them tissue culture. So whatever visual cue works for you, go for it. And look, here's another one, and I want to show you this because this is a variant that looks quite different because it has a lot more collagen. Sometimes you get very loose myxoid nausea fasciitis. Sometimes you get very cellular mitotically active, particularly in the early, um, the early cellular growth phase of nausea fasciitis. In the older lesions that are kind of uh, burnt out, they become more sclerotic and collagenized. I don't know if it always follows an exact timeline like that, but that's the way I kind of think of it in my mind. So here we still have a feathery kind of tissue culture area where the cells are not only spindled, but kind of jagged, pointy, triangular shaped, um, stellate, star shaped, if you like, whatever word resonates with you for these, these types of cells, okay? And then in other areas, you can have sclerotic collagen, right? Mitoses are okay in nausea fasciitis. They can be quite abundant, especially in those early uh, rapid growth phase of nausea fasciitis. But what you don't want to see is hyperchromatic pleomorphism, okay? You can see kind of atypical big cells in the form of ganglion-like cells, which we'll talk about in a second, but you should not see hyperchromatic, pleomorphic, bizarre, ugly-looking nuclei. That's not what you want to see in nausea fasciitis. But mitoses, no problem. Okay, so how do you get used to what's okay for, for myofibroblasts to look like? Well, even though I just told you nodular fasciitis is a tumor, but it's a tumor that very much has morphologic overlap with the changes we see in the myofibroblast of granulation tissue and, and tissue repair, like at a biopsy site. So I think what I tell my trainees is study reactive changes in biopsy sites. When you get an excision that has post-biopsy changes from a previous biopsy, when you know it's not a sarcoma, when it's an excision of a carcinoma or a melanoma or something, go and study those myofibroblasts when you know that they're benign there. And that's the way you can get comfortable with the range of cytologic features and mitotic activity and just how kind of plump and weird looking myofibroblasts can be when they're actively growing. Okay, the, the 
blue to purple amphiphilic cytoplasm that's very abundant. The kind of uh, triangle shape that you can see with the kind of two or three different branching processes. The large nuclei with fine chromatin and punctate nucleoli. All of those features really common in myofibroblasts reactive or in the setting of nausea fasciitis. So study those post-surgical changes. The same is true for the, the reactive keratinocyte changes at the epidermis. If you're a trainee, go study that when you know it's a melanoma excision. Go and look at how weird the keratinocytes can look when they're reactive. And then that'll help you somewhat when you're, when you're struggling on, should I call this squamous cell carcinoma or reactive pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. The time to learn is when you know it's benign. So there, that's my, that's my soapbox moment for teaching. Um, uh, you guys today. Now, these kind of cells are the cells that you can sometimes see in nausea fasciitis or when they're really abundant, like here, we would call this proliferative fasciitis or if it was down in the muscle, proliferative myositis. But these cells have a unique specific look. They look like ganglion cells. They have abundant cytoplasm, big round nuclei and large central nucleoli, like an eyeball staring up at you. And they are scattered in a background that looks like nausea fasciitis loose, mixoid, hypocellular, with extravasated erythrocytes. A lot of people like that as a clue for nausea or fasciitis. I, I honestly have not found that terribly helpful, but I know some other really great soft tissue pathologists who really like to see the extravasated erythrocytes. So, so if you like it, cool, no problem at all. Um, so that I find the fact that scattered uh, ganglion-like cells in a background that looks like nodular fasciitis is really helpful in reassuring to me of benign when you see cells like this because otherwise these cells look really scary and weird. But even though they're big and atypical, they're not hyperchromatic really, okay? Not usually at least. They have that kind of open chromatin still. All right, so there you go. And again, the background changes are everything. And of course, also making sure that the clinical makes sense. Uh, one really difficult and challenging thing is particularly in kids when they get proliferative myositis or fasciitis, it can be quite cellular and closely packed ganglion-like cells. In those cases, I still feel pretty nervous about and, and uh, look at with great trepidation and, and, uh, and anxiety sometimes. So thankfully, I, I only have rarely encountered those, but, but uh, otherwise the loose background is helpful. And here you can see the splayed apart skeletal muscle. In this case, this was proliferative myositis. And then the loose fasciitis, like background in between, very helpful. And that's a great example of proliferative myositis, um, where the, the, the outlines of the original um, skeletal muscle bundles are still there, but the individual fibers are separated by fasciitis and ganglion-like cells. And in between, the muscle bundles are spread apart by a fasciitis-like background. So that, that kind of quilt-like pattern of muscle splayed apart by fasciitis is really helpful. And then, oh, here's, I put these out of order. Here's a flashback to nausea fasciitis. It's just another case, not quite as mixoid. It's a little bit washed out. But again, you can see beautiful cystic breakdown and feathery tissue culture areas and extravasated red cells as well. Okay, more, more nausea fasciitis videos online if you like them.